you're out of, from out of town and you have taken it upon yourself to put the Lord first and to worship Him in spirit and in truth is appreciated. And for those who are visiting from close, we're happy to have you also. And again, if there's anything we can do for you, please let us know. If you have a question about why we sing without instruments of music, please ask us. If, if that is something that you're, you're, you, you haven't seen before, we would be so happy to discuss that with you. If you have a question about anything that I say, please don't hesitate to ask also. I'll be back at the, uh, at the back at the end of the service. Uh, pretty much, if there's anything we can do, it would not be a burden. It would be a pleasure. You've got outlines for asking a question. Was the law perfect? And what I'm going to do, instead of going back through, and you can peruse the outline if you'd like, and we're going to be on the back of that outline already. We've covered a lot of ground. But as you peruse that, basically I'm going to go back to Hebrews 10, and Hebrews 10 is going to summarize essentially everything that we've said so far. <clears throat> so we're just going to go back there, and we're going to think about for just a moment what we've covered so far, asking the question, is the law perfect? And if so, in what way was it perfect, and in what way... Was it perhaps deficient in some way? <clears throat> For the law having a shadow of good things to come, but not the very image of those things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there into perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the ones, or worshippers once purged would have no more consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices there is remembrance again made of sin every year. That's important. Hebrews 10.4 Remembrance, again, made every year. Notice the emphasis of the idea of continual, continual, every year, every year, the uh, Day of Atonement. <clears throat> but in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sin every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me, Hebrews 10.5. In burnt offerings, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God, above. When he say a sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not neither had pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified by the offering of the body of Christ once for all. Hebrews 10, 1 through 10. That summarizes what we've covered. The law of Moses was given to a very specific people for a very specific purpose for a very specific time. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verses 3 through 15 teaches that very point very succinctly. It, it summarizes that very idea that the law was given to only specific people. It was given for a very specific reason. And we understand that it will last for a very specific time. The purpose of the law of Moses was not to bring redemption to those under the law. In Hebrews chapter 7, the text would say right around verse 18, For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before, for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing Perfect. But the bringing in of a, better, uh, of a better covenant, he would go on to say, that would accomplish what the law failed to do. Well, well, Eric, I thought you said that the law of the Lord was perfect. In Psalm 19.7 it says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Well, was it perfect or wasn't it? Well, we argue that the law was perfect for its purpose. The problem is many people misunderstand the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law was not to bring redemption to mankind. The purpose of the law was to teach a nation and prepare them for the one who would bring redemption. So the idea is if we say that, well, the law, it was, it was really inadequate for the purpose God intended. Well, that's a reflection upon God, is it not? If God is omnipotent, Revelation 19, 6, the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. If God is omnipotent, that means all-powerful. Do you think that an all-powerful God could create a law that was perfect for its purpose? Well, certainly. And he did. It's just so often we misunderstand the purpose of the law. The law was not intended to bring redemption to this people. The law was intended to teach them. Galatians 3, 24. It was meant to prepare them. Hebrews 10, 1 through 10. 
it was meant to illustrate to them that when you see this objective standard, this law, and Paul would say in Romans 7 verse 13 that this law served that purpose, that is to make sin exceeding sinful, or in other words, to emphasize sin. So when I see a law right here and I, all I see are, are bullet points that say what I can and cannot do, when I fail, what does that do? It just condemns me. This says you're guilty and there's nothing here that would pardon you from it. So what this does is, is this teaches man, I fail miserably. And I'm not good enough. So that would teach reliance upon God and that would illustrate how often we fail. So what that would do is that would prepare a people for the sacrifice God planned from eternity, Revelation 13, 8. It would prepare them for something to come. Let me show you this also. Imagine every year, Leviticus 16. Every year coming for 16 centuries. Coming to the high priest and bringing that little animal with you. You could just imagine if, if you had a, a lamb or a goat and you would maybe tether him with a little rope around his neck and you would pull him and he follows you everywhere he goes. Wouldn't he? Trusting little critter. And then you take him there to the, the priest. You take him to the high priest, and what does he do? He, he, he lays his hand or your hand upon their head, and that is the, the idea of, 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 of your sins being released. It's, it's all figurative, right? And then, of course, the lamb, they cut his throat, and you see his blood flow. Do you think that that would prepare you? Do you think that that would teach you of the nature of sin? Sin's ugly. Sin's, sin's a big deal. You know what the world says today? It's no big deal. The world says you can do whatever you want to with whoever you want to under any circumstances and it's no big deal because who are we to judge? And love is love, right? That's what they say. So it doesn't matter. Well, they're dead wrong, obviously, for many, many reasons. But the idea is sin is a big deal and sin is such a big deal that it cost a life. And sin is such a big deal that it cost the life of the Son of God. That's how big a deal it is. So when you have all of these sacrifices every year, that would bring to their mind, you know what? Sin is a big deal because my sins cost a life. So when we say the law was preparatory, that's what we mean. It prepared them, it taught them concerning sin, concerning the cost of sin, and concerning the sacrifice that Christ would make. It taught them about God. It taught them about His nature. Have you ever read the book of Leviticus? Have you ever read the book of Leviticus with this idea in mind? God is absolutely holy. You ever read it like that? Read it like that. Why is it that man is so easily infirmed? Why is it that so easily man can be uh, pushed out of fellowship from God? Why is it that man must offer this, Leviticus 1? Why is it that man must offer that, Leviticus 2? Why is it that man should offer this, Leviticus 3? All the way down the line. Why were there trespass offerings? Why were there sin offerings? Why were there burnt offerings? Why were there meal offerings? Why were there wave offerings? Why were there, why were there all of these offerings? Why, what was the point of all of this? It emphasized God's holiness. God is absolutely holy. And man so often, because of his own choices, separates himself from this holy nature that God has, right? So we have that idea. It would teach them concerning God's holiness. You know, in Romans 15, 4, it says the things written aforetime are written for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Who? Paul, writing in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10, says, And these are an example unto us. We can go back and we can look at the Old Testament and we can see exactly how God dealt with man, what God expects of man. And, and we can see a beautiful picture painted of God's nature. God means what He says, doesn't He? In Genesis chapter 6, when He said, Make thee an ark of gopher wood, He meant what He said, didn't He? In Genesis 6 and verse 22, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Hebrews 11 and verse 7 says, By faith Noah prepared. God means what He says. When God appears to Abraham and says, Go into the land of Moriah and offer thy son, thine only son whom I love, whom thou lovest, offer him there for me. Genesis 22, 1 through 3. What did Abraham do? Yes, sir. And he went. When God sets boundaries on a specific day, Exodus 16, 17, and Numbers 
uh, as you go further into the book of Numbers, chapters 14 through 22, God sets uh, uh, requirements on a certain day. You will do no work this day. What happened when that fellow was gathering sticks on the Sabbath day? Does God mean what he says? In Leviticus 16, 12, when God says, you'll take a coal from the altar and burn incense to me. In Leviticus 10, when Nadab and Abihu took fire from somewhere else, what happened to them? God killed them on the spot. Why? Because God's serious. His nature demands it. So from the Old Testament, we can learn a lot about God, about who He is, and about His requirements for man. Why does God, why did God give laws, and why do we still live under laws today religiously? Why? Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 and 13 would say, For thy own good. The idea of God's revelation for man is for man's own benefit. So we can learn that the law of Moses was preparatory. It was instructional in nature. It had no intention of actually being a universal covenant, nor was it going to be an eternal covenant. This was given for a specific time, for a specific reason to a specific people. And it would be done away with, and it was. And Paul illustrates this quite nicely, summarizes this in Colossians 2, beginning in verse 14. He would say that he had... Uh, the, he had taken away the handwriting of ordinances which was contrary to us, nailing it to the cross. Having spoiled principalities, that is, authorities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over the men. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink. That doesn't mean you can eat and drink whatever you want to. That doesn't mean you can have some Jack Daniels with dinner. That's talking about the law offerings, the aspects of the law. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink. Or in respect of a holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. He's saying that all of the things that led before all of the Old Testament ordinances were pointing towards Christ. It was preparatory. It was instructional. But the sacrifice of Christ, Hebrews 10.5, that was more than instructional or preparatory. That was a sacrifice under a covenant in which redemption was offered. Through the blood of his cross. Colossians 1 verse 20. So we have summarized pretty nicely. Basically what we have studied so far. So let's continue in this study. Let me ask you a question. Why was the law removed. If it was perfect. Have we established the fact that it was perfect? I think we have, right? Psalm 19, 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. We said that it was perfect for its intended purpose. The purpose was to teach and instruct. And in that case, it was absolutely perfect. It was designed and implemented by God. Thus, it was perfect. Well, if it was perfect, why was it taken away? It's a good question. Isn't it? It's a valid question. It's a question that we should have no problem answering. Why did the law, why was the law taken away? If you've got any Seventh-day Adventist friends, I've got Seventh-day Adventist friends, and they might ask you a question like this because they don't believe that the law was done away with. They think that the ceremonial law, the feast days were taken away, but they believe that the Ten Commandments are still in effect. Well, the Ten Commandments are not in effect, and they've never been in effect for you, ever. They were nailed to the cross. Romans 7, verse 4, Paul says you're dead to the law. Romans 7, 6, Paul says you're delivered from the law. And there in verses 7 and 8, he tells you exactly what law you're delivered from. Because he, what part of the law said, thou shalt not covet? That's Exodus 20, that's the Ten Commandments. Why was the law done away with if it was perfect? Because the law was always intended to be temporary. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 8. Hebrews chapter 8. And I think we can establish this fact. The Hebrews writer would say, Now of the things which we have spoken... When you read a text like that at the beginning of a chapter heading, where should you look back to? Let's look back at the previous chapter and what information was provided. Well, when we preached Hebrews, we preached that Hebrews chapter 7, in essence, a synopsis was this. The superior sacrifice of Christ. Wherefore he is able to save to the uttermost those that draw nigh unto him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Verse 25. He would go on to say that Christ is a, is a high priest not made after the law. But it was a promise that this Christ, this, this eternal being who was made into a man and died for us, he would ever live to make intercession for us. He is a priest forever. 
Chapter 8 says, Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have, that's a present tense word. We have such an high priest. The point of chapter 7 was he's a greater high priest. He's a superior priest. Chapter 8 says we've established that. We have currently this high priest. Where is he? Is he in the temple working daily? Who is set on the right hand of the majesty on high. Right hand is a position of power. And it's also significant that Christ, having made that sacrifice once, sat down. Hebrews 10, 11, and 12. He's not standing daily. He made it once for all. Verse 2. A minister. Speaking of Christ, he is a minister. What did the priests do under the tabernacle system? What were they, what were they considered? What were they considered? Ministers or servants. That, that's what minister means. It means servant. They worked in the tabernacle. What is Jesus doing? A minister of the tabernacle. Well, which tabernacle? The sanctuary, the true tabernacle, not uh, which the Lord pitched and not man. You know what Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18? Upon the confession that he was the son of God by Peter. He says, and thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build somebody's church. Whose was it? I will build my church. Question, is church plural or singular? I will build my church. This, friends, is Hebrews 8.2. This is the sanctuary built by God and not man. And Jesus is the minister of it. He is the high priest of his church. Verse 3. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore it is of necessity that this man have someone also to offer. He will go on to say that if he lived under the law, those would be inadequate sacrifices. But the sacrifice he made was a greater sacrifice, right? The summary of Hebrews chapter 8 is a greater covenant. Chapter 7, superior priesthood. Chapter 8, superior covenant. And the Hebrews writer is going to go and quote Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. If the law was perfect, why was it taken away? Because it was meant to be a temporal, teaching, instructional, preparatory covenant. It was never universal, and it was never intended to be universal. Hebrews 8, 4. For if he, Christ, were on earth, he could not offer. He should not be a priest. Do you see that? Do you know that there's some things God can and cannot do? You know, sometimes when I say something like that, somebody would look up at me. What? You mean God can't do some things? That's right. Titus 1-2 says God can't lie. If you're in the book of Hebrews, flip back to chapter 6 and look at verse 16. There are two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. God can't lie. There are some things God can't do. It's not that God would lie because he would never lie. It's contrary to his nature. It's impossible for him to lie. Right? He can't do it. There's some things God can't do. If Jesus Christ, if, if redemption was going to be offered under the law, it doesn't involve Jesus because Jesus couldn't be a priest under the law. Do you know why? Turn in your Bibles back to chapter 7 and look at verse 14. That's why. He could not be a priest under the law because Moses spake nothing concerning. There was no authority for Judah. There was only authority for Levi. And because there was only authority for Levi under the law of Moses, God said, I'm going to change the priesthood, therefore I'll change the law. And that's what he says. That's what he did. So if he were on earth, he couldn't be a priest, seeing that they are priests that offer gifts according to the law. Verse 5 says, Who serve or which serve unto example and shadow of heavenly things? What was an example and shadow of heavenly things? The entire law and all of its ordinances, especially the priesthood. The priesthood, the tabernacle, the service, the curtain. Y'all remember what separated the most holy place from the holy place? A, a veil, a curtain. Does that have any symbolism? Oh, doesn't it? What was on that curtain? A cherubim. What was on the mercy seat? Cherubim. What was in the garden blocking man's way back into fellowship with God after man's sin? A cherubim. The Old Testament is literally permeated. It is full of shadows and, and, and types of which antitypes are made in the New Testament. It is one of the most spectacular and enriching studies you could ever do to do a study on typology and shadows of the Old Testament. 
It says, who served to the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God as he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou maketh all things according to the pattern that I showed thee in the mount. Is God concerned with details? Here's what you can do. If you're not convinced God's concerned with details, go back to about Exodus 20 and just read Exodus 20 through the end of the, end of the book. And what you're going to see is all of the curtains, all of the tabernacle, all of the instruments, all of the altars, all of the labors, all of the, uh, the, the snuffers, all of the things concerning the, uh, the shoe bread, and all of it, you're going to see all that detail, all of the incense that could be burned, and I want you to tell me that God's not concerned with details. If God said do it this way, how do we display our trust in God? Do it exactly the way God said. Yes, sir. You know better than me, God. What does it say whenever God says do it this way? And I'm like, mm, but I like, I like it this other way. Who's God now? I've thoroughly placed myself on the throne, have Verse 6 says, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he has made the mediator of a better testament established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there should no place have been sought for the what? The second. Why was the law done away with? Well, Eric, it just said right there that it, the law had fault. Well, the law couldn't have been perfect if it had fault. No, 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 remember we're talking about different things in different contexts. The law was perfect for its purpose, but the law was inadequate in some things also because the law couldn't save because God never designed it to save. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. You know what he says in the next verse? For finding fault with... Are y'all there? What's it say in Hebrews 8.8? 8? For finding fault with them or finding fault with it. That's a personal pronoun, plural, them. For finding fault with them, he said, I will make a new covenant. God never violated his covenant with man, but man constantly violated his covenant with God. But that all played into God's plan because God never intended for this covenant to be a permanent institution. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians 3, please. Galatians 3. The law was designed as an educator Verse 23 says, but before faith. Notice the contrast that Paul so often makes between systems. And when I say systems, I mean the law and the gospel. John makes that distinction in John 1.17. For the law came by Moses, but grace and truth by Christ. Does that mean there was no grace and truth under the law? Was the law of Moses not truth? Yes, it was true. But he's contrasting covenants isn't he he's contrasting the superiority of christ in his covenant to the spirit or to the inferiority of moses and it that's exactly what happens in hebrews 1 through 3 by the way but before faith came paul often contrasts faith that is the system of faith the gospel to law that is the system of law of moses if you read the book of romans and you understand the contrast between the gospel and the law you're going to have a much better understanding than many of our some of our own brethren especially our friends and neighbors involved in denominationalism who who completely miss romans i'll throw it out there and i don't mind uh, one bit and i could back it up i believe almost everybody misunderstands romans i got no problem saying that because most of the religious world has no clue Oh, Romans is all grace. You've lost your mind. Romans 1, 5 and Romans 16, 26, Paul opens a book and closes it with the obedience of faith. When Paul contrasts law in the book of Romans, he's contrasting the law of Moses, not law in general. And he iterates that, that time after time after time after time in that beautiful, wonderful epistle. But before faith came, that's the system of faith. Before the gospel was revealed, we were kept under the law. Shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Notice the contrast between systems, the law and the faith. In Galatians 1.23, Paul says that he preached the faith which he once persecuted. What did he preach? You know what he preached. Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation unto all that believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, where Paul? 
In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. It's a system of faith that produces faith. God revealed it. The righteousness of God, that is how God makes man right, is through the gospel. And that's the only way man's going to be saved, through the gospel. Yeah. Verse 24, wherefore the law was our what? Our tutor, our schoolmaster, our teacher, whatever the... Whatever your version has, as long as it's a reasonable version, you probably get the, the idea conveyed. It was instructional in nature, wasn't it? It was meant to be something that would teach us concerning the things we needed to learn for the new covenant. And that's exactly what it did. That we might be justified by faith. Think about this. The entire purpose of the law, all those centuries, 16 centuries of it, was preparation for a greater covenant to come. That's exactly what Paul says in verse 24. Paul says in Colossians 2, we quoted a few moments ago for you, it was a shadow. In verse 17 of Colossians 2, it was a shadow, but Christ is the, depending on what version you have, substance or body. The American Standard and the King James use both. The idea is the same. If you're out there on a sunny day and you've got substance, you're going to cast a shadow, aren't you? And that shadow is the entirety of the law that leads right back to the feet of Christ. His substance casts that shadow. Therefore, all of this is a foreshadow of these wonderful things to come in Christ. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that easy to understand? Now, I'm not saying that it's easy to understand every law and ordinance and how it was preparatory. That takes a lot of time and effort to go back and look. But I'll tell you right now, you won't be disappointed if you do it. That is some enriching studies. It described a. Uh, it is described as if you turn in your Bibles over one chapter, Galatians four. The law is described as fleshly, and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to cover as much material as I can <clears throat> on any uh, any ideas that well the law was perfect, but it was also described as being inadequate sometimes. Well, the law was perfect, but it was also descri also described as being fleshly. Is that a contradiction? Certainly not. Certainly not. Doesn't it make sense that the old law would be a physical manifestation of a spiritual truth to come? Doesn't it make sense that the old law would have all of the carnal ordinances that spoke of better spiritual things to come? That's easy, isn't it? That's easy to grasp, and that is in perfect harmony with the type and a type system. In Galatians 4, verse 21 says, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by bondmaid and the other by free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. What does he mean there? Whose idea was it for Hagar to get involved? Wasn't God's idea, was it? So in this instance, when we use the word, when Paul uses the word fleshly here uh, of the flesh, that means that it came from the wisdom of man. Abraham and Sarah are the ones that said, hey, let's get Hagar involved because we haven't had a child yet. God said, I will make you a great nation. God had intended for Isaac and his lawful life, uh, wife Sarah to have Isaac all this time. But it hadn't happened yet. So what does man do? Oh, I'll help you out, God. I'll, I'll, I'll pitch in and do my part. No thanks. So when it's considered fleshly by Paul, that means that it's of the wisdom of man. It's, it's, it's worthless. But the free woman was by promise. Isaac was the seed of promise. Which things are an allegory or a metaphor. For these are the two covenants. One from Sinai. Which one was that? That's the law of Moses, which gendereth to bondage. Why, why is the law so often associated with bondage? Why did Peter say in Acts 15 when the Pharisees were trying to bind circumcision and keeping the law, why did he say it was a yoke of bondage upon our fathers and they were not able to bear it? Why is it described that way? Because it brought, you remember our bullet list here? It brought sin, didn't it? It brought condemnation. What about this released you from sin? Nothing. So you're, you're what? You're in bondage. Jesus would say that very thing. The idea that he that commits sin is a servant of sin. You're in bondage to it. Which things are an allegory for these are the two covenants? The one from Sinai, that's the law which gendereth to bondage. That's Agar or Hagar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to Jerusalem, which now is. You remember we were talking about that in the book of Acts in our reviews and our, our, our afternoon service? We always talk about that. 
we emphasize that the law of Moses was done away with, it was abrogated, it was nailed to the cross, it was completely, fully, thoroughly removed, and the gospel is a completely distinct covenant. It is not a continuation. It's not the same thing reinvented. It's a totally new covenant. One was from Sinai. One was from Jerusalem. Y'all remember what Isaiah would write? Michael would write it too. In Michael 4, 2, Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. You know what he says? He said, let us go into the, the house of the God of Jacob. And he describes it as the word of the Lord going forth from Zion and the, and the, the, uh, the law from Jerusalem or vice versa. Jerusalem is a distinct place from Sinai. The gospel is a distinct gospel or covenant from the law of Moses, right? It's distinct in every way. And the, the law foreshadowed the spiritual beauty of the gospel. All right, we're going to stop right there. We're out of time. We will. Uh, we actually got a few slides in today, so the, the end is near on this lesson. We won't be in it for too much longer, surely. I'd like to extend the invitation at this point. Are there any here today that have never obeyed the gospel? Please listen to me. If you, if you haven't listened at all, please listen to this. We don't want anyone to be lost. That is why we offer this invitation. It is not that we think we know better than you, that we're haughty or arrogant, not in any way. We know that the Bible teaches that only those that obey the Lord will be saved. Hebrews 5, 9. We want you to obey the Lord. Have you? The Bible says we must hear the word of God. If we're going to believe in Christ, we must get this information from his inspired word. That's John 20, verse 31. Jesus says, except you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. John 8, 24. John 6, 29. It is a work to believe in Christ. Something that God obligates us to do. We must do so. Faith comes by hearing God's word, Romans 10, 17. We must believe in Jesus. We must repent of our sins. Acts 17, 30, repentance is a change in mind, a change in will, a change in heart. We must acknowledge our faith in Christ, Romans 10 and verse 10. Confession is made with the mouth and it goes unto or toward salvation. And we must be baptized for the remission of sins. Why? Because God said so. Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Baptism is for the remission of sins. Acts 2.38, Acts 22.16. Those who obey the gospel are added to the one and only church. Acts 2 and verse 47. And you're forgiven of all sins. Romans 6, 16 through 18. We must then continue in our faithfulness, right? We learn and we grow and we study and we assemble with our local congregation of the Lord's church and we live that godly life like we're supposed to. 1 John 1, 2, and 3. For those who have obeyed the gospel, what if you've walked away from that? What if you've departed from the truth? What if you are not doing what you ought to be doing? We would encourage you also. God wants you to come back to Him. And if you acknowledge your sin in prayer to God, and if you truly repent of those things, God will forgive you. He loves you so much, as a matter of fact, He said, that if we see our brother sin a sin that is not unto death, that is a sin you're willing to repent of, that we can pray for you and God will forgive you. As long as you're willing to repent, God will forgive you. 1 John 5, 16. So that's why we offer the invitation to those who've never obeyed. We'll study with you. We'll show you exactly what the Bible teaches. And you'll know exactly what you're being added to and what you're doing. And all your faith will be in God, not man. And for those who want to come back, we can show you exactly what the Bible teaches there too. God will forgive you. Don't ever say you're too far gone because that's not possible as long as you're living. I'd like to extend this invitation. If any have need, the invitation is yours. Please come down as we stand and sing.